Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're coming at you with this week in cannabis news from January 9th to the 15th. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos. And then there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and take advantage whenever you feel ready if you wish to do so. And so good news after Connecticut has officially launched their adult use cannabis market as of Tuesday. As in the first day of sales, over $250,000 has been recorded according to BioTrack, a software likely tracking the sales on the first day. And so it looks like a solid start for adult use cannabis in Connecticut. But what do you think? Is $250,000 a little bit light compared to what we saw out of other markets like Montana and Vermont doing one or two million in the first day? Obviously, they're small. So is Connecticut. Connecticut only started with seven dispensaries, so very limited, similar to New Jersey. But I think New Jersey also did $2.5 million. So I'm not sure. It just seems a bit light to me. So let me know in the comments. Obviously, there's lots of room for growth. And so this story from NBCConnecticut.com did cover the rollout. So I'll put this link in the description if you wanted to check it out, but also got this one from WTNH.com. So Connecticut records more than 250K in adult use cannabis sales on opening day, um, but as of 5 p.m. So that makes a bit more sense. That's why it's a bit light, um, probably from 5 p.m. till 8, 9, 10. I don't know how late they stay open. We likely saw the sales increase, but it says the Connecticut Department of Consumer Protection said the state had recorded 251,276 in adult use sales up until 5 p.m. And so State officials said that the seven retailers did not report any issues on opening day, which is also another plus and great takeaway. And as many as 40 dispensaries, obviously more would be ideal, but 40 is much better than just seven or nine, along with dozens of other cannabis-related businesses are expected to eventually open in Connecticut uh, by the end of this year. And so there's a lot more detail in here, but just wanted to give you the main highlights. Uh, link will be below if you wanted to check that out. And so just wanted to share this one from Nats Fertig, who writes for Politico in DC and does provide a lot of good uh, info for us. She highlights that Jim Jordan is no friend of cannabis descheduling and he's set to take charge of the House Judiciary Committee, where bills like the Moore Act, States Reform Act, and possibly even the HOPE Act would need to funnel through. While that is unfortunately true, I figured I'd share this because it is worth knowing, although none of us are holding our breath for cannabis descheduling, it would be the best possible thing, but, you know, one incremental step at a time if we finally get one of these steps. But to contrast this, I wanted to share this from Don Murphy, who claims to be a lobbyist in DC. So take this with a grain of salt because I'm just trying to share the relevant information that I find and I'm just taking his word for it through Twitter. Um, but according to Don Murphy, uh, just so we're clear, I don't work for MSOs or Marijuana Policy Project. They haven't had a lobbyist on the Hill since they closed their federal policy office two years ago, which is unfortunate to hear because while we expect more lobbying possibly being done, it seems like it's just coming from some of the cannabis MSOs. Uh, although you wouldn't know it by reading their website or fundraising emails because yeah, I almost thought, well, it seems like these guys would have been active for the last little while. That would have been really helpful for this cause. Um, but thank you, Will, for commenting this. Do you see Jim Jordan getting House Judiciary as an issue? Which Nats just tweeted about, right? Obviously, it's not great to hear that against descheduling, but obviously there's House GOP support, but could it be an issue? Appreciate your thoughts. I just wanted to share this because it's relevant to what Nats shared in the last post. Well, if you're hoping for the Moore Act or CAOA Act, which we're not hoping for, yeah, they're dead. Great news because that's essentially what we want out of those awful bills. But for the Safe Banking Act or appropriation riders, he's not in the way. And so in contrast to the previous comments about Jim Jordan being against descheduling, this is the best possible thing that we can hope for because the Moore Act is garbage, the COA Act is garbage. We want as little taxes as possible and we want the industry to try and be able to build themselves from the ground up with equal access to opportunity for as many people as possible. And so is Don Murphy telling the truth? Only time will tell. Uh, we'll try to hold him accountable. But again, this is just better contrast to hear this uh, as after hearing what we heard about Jim Jordan being against descheduling. Now, now this one from Kyle Yeager writing for Marijuana Moment. Today, a bill to legalize cannabis in Minnesota has cleared its first House committee for the 2023 session. Yay, good job. One down, 12 more to go. Shit, this takes a long time. So I will update you as this story moves along, but I'll put the link as well in the description if you want to check it out. Next up is the House Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee. So it's got to go through separate, many separate committees, um, but good to see that it's gotten through the first one as well. And so this one from Marijuana Moment, Hawaii lawmakers announced cannabis legalization push for 2023 with newly seated pro-reform governor. So that sounds promising. Legalizing cannabis is not just a matter of money. It's a matter of moralities, sure, and just doing the right thing after all this time. And while Hawaii's talked about this for a long time, I remember reporting on this at least in 2022, maybe even 2021, that they're looking to get this done. Hopefully better late than never, uh, because obviously since um, a lot of states have already acted, many others are realizing that they're missing out on the tax revenue and the jobs and they want to capitalize on that. And so uh, that link will be down below as well. Tom Angle, thanks for sharing this one. Is apparently there's a tri-state war of words over cannabis, which is kind of pathetic because these governors should try to be working together as much as possible and to unite, you know, 
people's ideas on on this whole launching adult use uh, and the benefits of ending prohibition. But regardless, Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont touted his state's rollout for cannabis sales and called New York crazy for starting with just one dispensary. Now, he's not wrong. Um, you know, you could be a bit more constructive and but it's not like New Jersey's. It's not like New York's going to listen to what the Connecticut governor says, anyways. It's just funny. But last week, as New Jersey and New York officials knocked each other's plans, you got Connecticut's popping out uh, after a measly 250k, you know, from the first morning to 5 p.m. Just highlighting though that yeah, you need to have more than one dispensary if you want to try and chip away at the black market whatsoever and make your citizens happy so that they can get access to somewhat of a cheaper, uh, safer, non-addictive medicinal alternative. And so with that, some New York news though. Thank you, Brad Racino, editor and publisher at New York Canna Insight. Has smacked, which I believe is the name of the dispensary in this context, will be the first C A U R D store to open outside of the nonprofit Housing Works dispensary. And so, yay, New York is finally getting their second legal outlet so that they can try to compete with the black market that they've allowed to thrive for the last year and a half. Hearing a timeline of this Friday to middle of next week for the soft open on Bleecker Street. So, love to hear that. At least number two is coming out. Hopefully, that will lead to three, four, all the way up to 60 uh, and down the line. But just a bit more information on that, Jeff Schultz. Thank you for adding your two cents to some comments that were made previously. So, you can pause to read for the whole thing, but just to highlight the next door is opening next week and so confirming what brad racino said um, and they'll continue to open on a rollout basis for many years more product will become available over time remember they're planning to go from zero to 60 again this is their plan they haven't been very good at executing on any of their plans prohibition to adult use as we have a very weak medical market and even those operators are sidelined for now and so a little bit more info in here so you can pause to read for more details but thank you jeff schultz for sharing and so his knowledge is probably limited right now take this with a grain of salt if you will but thank you for the little bit of update information based on what you might know as a New York-based cannabis attorney. And so Jeff Schultz is a great resource on the New York situation if you did want to follow to keep tabs. And why does New York need more dispensaries? Well, the only dispensary opened in the state of New York, uh, New York State Cannabis, has terrible reviews with customers recommending people drive to New Jersey to get higher quality brands they want altogether. And so obviously we want to hear more of this feedback so that New York hurries their asses up and, you know, gets as many stores online as possible. But it's just, you can pause to read to get a good laugh out of what happens when you focus so much on equity as opposed to equal access to opportunity. Um, it's just people in charge of the industry ruining it for everyone else, making everyone equally poor by giving no one an opportunity to even start and get going. It's very sad. But on to some better states. This one coming from Florida. Office of Medical Cannabis Use for this past week. If we look at dispensary improvements from January 9th to the 13th, good to see many dispensaries chugging along or many MSOs chugging along and continuing to open dispensaries. Cureleaf opened one in West Palm Beach. Uh, Green Dragon opened two dispensaries, Jacksonville and Panama City. Move back by Verano opened one in Navarre and the Flowery opened another dispensary in Jacksonville. If we look at their qualified patient count for this past week. Florida did increase their number of patients up to 783,416, which represents a week-over-week -week increase of 2,062 patients. So good to see a large number switching to a safer, non-addictive medicinal alternative. And if we look at all the MSOs and the dispensations for January 6th to the 12th, 2023, we can see all the MSOs that operate in Florida, the number of active dispensaries that they have open, and then we can see the number of milligrams of THC, number of milligrams of CBD, and ounces of smokable flour sold for this past week. And so good to see strong numbers across the board. Uh, and again, thank you, Pierre Gilles, for making this easy and digestible for us as he puts all this data into a Florida THC market share comp sheet, uh, highlighting the top eight MSOs with the most market share in the state of Florida. And so uh, he, does he does update this weekly, which is great, but interesting to see as well. Truly, number one, obviously uh, holding that down, but then Air Cannabis Dispensary coming in at number two, jumping ahead of Cureleaf. Uh, and I believe they were even behind Move a few weeks ago. So good to see Air. Uh, and that's what they're hopefully pushing for as they continue to open many dispensaries um, and stay competitive with the tier ones. And then we got Cureleaf number three now, Move number four, Sertera Wellness number five, and then Fluent number six, Vitican number seven, Grow Healthy number eight. And so lots are changing, things are changing quickly in Florida, but love to see uh, the competition because it's, a, it's an early sign of things to come once they go adult use. And so with that, Cureleaf announces opening of Palm Beach Gardens. So, so this is the press release covering that recent West Palm Beach opening as they also launch new Blue Kudu chocolates in Florida. So Stepping up their edibles game here, which is also good to see to compete with others. So Cureleaf's retail presence grows to 56 locations in Florida and 146 nationwide. Two new flavors of Blue Kudu chocolate products launching statewide on January 13th. So more information here if you just wanted to pause to read about Cureleaf if you're interested in their operations as well. Uh, again, this is not advice.
price, just sharing the information, but you can learn more about the uh, location and the new products that they're launching down here. And so with that, uh, thank you DNBC for sharing this one. It's Trulieve spends another $5 million, and so it seems like at this point they've spent up to $20 million in total. So thank you, Trulieve, for putting your money where your mouth is to put recreational cannabis on Florida's 2024 ballot. And this is still up in the air. It's not a guarantee, but... They're obviously really pushing and really going for it in Florida. So if you wanted to read more about this, I will put the link in the description, but love to highlight this because someone's gotta be doing it. It seems to be coming from all the MSOs. But seriously, kudos to the CEOs of these companies that have said, fuck the federal overhang and focused on the state-led story. Um, and in doing so, they've changed the status quo for the better by providing a safer, non-addictive medicinal alternative. And they're highlighting that Americans wanna vote for legal cannabis with their dollars. If you build it, the people will come. And soon they will be cash flow positive. Obviously, once we get 280 out of the way, they'd already be cash flow positive, but happy to share that cash flow from operations and cash balances. Thank you, Jesse Redmond, for providing this from Needham. For many of the MSOs like Green Thumb, Verano, Cureleaf, Cresco Labs, Jushi, Terrasend, Air Wellness, Ascend Wellness Holdings, TrueLeave, and Columbia Care. So mostly tier one and tier two MSOs. And so this is data as of Q3, but highlighting that cash flow from operations uh, thus far this year, despite all of, uh, you know, having their hands tied behind their back with 280 and everything, we've got Green Thumb with the most at 138 million, Verano 128 million, Cureleaf 65 million, Cresco 50 53 million, while the rest of the MSOs uh, are in the negative, but working the way back up to positive numbers. And so this is including the trailing four quarters, and again, coming from Needham with the data, um, cash balances as of Q3 as well. So Cureleaf has the most cash, 198 million, Green Thumb, 147 million, Cresco, 130 million, Trulieve, 114 million, Air Wellness, 101 million, Ascend Wellness, 91, Verano, 76, Columbia Care, 50, Terrasend, 34, Jushi, 31. And obviously, as they have less cash, it gets a little riskier, but the whole idea is once you can produce cash flow from operations, that's going to continue to uh, replenish your cash balances without having to raise money and dilute uh, with you know dilute equity or or raise any more debt so obviously things can be looking up for these companies uh, if they can make it through these difficult times uh, and last long enough to get 280 repealed um, and you know just get some of their profit back uh, and have some of the changes that we've been waiting for for a long time so just wanted to share some of the positives uh, obviously what's happening on the ground is different from what we're seeing on the scoreboards or the share prices um, but I think you know obviously there's that massive discrepancy and it has to fix at some point. So Todd Harrison, ATB on U.S. cannabis as well, highlights and takeaways. There's a lot here, more focus on the Pennsylvania market, what's going on in Virginia and Nevada as well. But main takeaway at the bottom here on the disappointing fate of SAFE in the recent lame duck session, the panelists highlighted that the real damage from the inability to advance SAFE is on the smaller mom and pop operators and that the industry players will need to speak with one voice to support advancement of regulatory reform. And while it seems like they've been trying to do that, it hasn't seemed like they've all come together and really made a big push. And if they can try and do that uh, in 2023 with the momentum behind it, that might be our best chance. But, you know, as we chug along, the industry isn't going anywhere. And while all we can really do is be patient while our bags do make us stronger, the good news is the data is often on our side. As people living in states with legal cannabis have lower rates of alcohol use disorder or alcoholism, according to Marijuana Moment, um, from a federally funded twin study. And so it's an interesting study, again, not necessarily as... as um, as reliable as some others, but researchers observed 240 pairs of twins in cases where one twin lived in a state that legalized cannabis and the other did not. So I guess trying to take the idea of the same person uh, but putting them in two different environments and seeing if that changes anything. So they found that while overall alcohol consumption did not significantly differ, those living in states where cannabis had been legalized were less likely to risk harm while under the influence of alcohol than their twins residing in a state where cannabis remained prohibited. And so obviously if you have access to legal cannabis, you're just going to be less inclined to switch to alcohol because if you're in a place where there's no legal cannabis, you only have alcohol as a substance. And so obviously this makes sense, but the findings do highlight that legalizing cannabis does not mean that the sky is falling. So recreational legalization was associated with increased cannabis use and decreased alcoholism symptoms, but was not associated with other maladaptations, the researchers from the University of Colorado and University of Minnesota wrote. We established evidence that suggests cannabis legalization causes a 0.11 standard deviation increase in cannabis frequency, whereas alcoholism symptoms decreased by 0.11 standard deviations, uh, driven by reductions in use of alcohol when physically hazardous. So it seems like uh, the legalization offsets the excessive alcohol abuse that we've seen over the many years of which is, I think, a good thing, positive takeaway. And so the peer-reviewed study published last week in the journal uh, Psychological Medicine cautioned, however, that this data is difficult to interpret and merits additional investigation in future work, obviously. While this sounds positive, the best thing we could do is deschedule and try and, you know, and just 
throw a flurry of research at cannabis to, to try and get as much accurate and posi- pos- possibly positive medicinal results right away. But I digress. Just to highlight as well, vulnerabilities to cannabis use were not exacerbated by the legal cannabis environment. Or in other words, at least from my understanding, that illegal cannabis environment did not make people susceptible to problems uh, with cannabis, much like we see alcohol in an environment where alcohol is legal. And so more information on the study and a bit more of a summary if you wanted to pause to read. Well, on to another one. Thank you, Todd Harrison, for sharing this study from NCBI. So I'll put the link below if you want to check this one out. But a review demonstrates cannabinoid treatment effects in alleviating motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, animal models, and supports the conduct of clinical trials of cannabis in PD population. And I think this would be beneficial if we could conduct this as soon as possible. Obviously, descheduling would allow this, but highlighting that uh, people that have difficulties controlling their motor functions based on certain diseases, whether it's Parkinson's or MS, we've seen I've seen many videos of this where they can't function beforehand, and then they take a bit of CBD, and then it's it's almost like they can act like normal. And the fact that this is, you know, not available to anyone that needs it, as CBD is safe for non-addictive alternative, is criminal, legit. Because when you see how he's functioning before and after, uh, my voice returns, it works most of the time, and you can see before with Parkinson's and then after, it's perfect. And so it would be great if we can get more of a push uh, and awareness on this. Obviously, most people, just, they don't care because this doesn't affect them. But this is another reason why cannabis ought to be descheduled sooner or later, so that people with Parkinson's and MS, other symptoms like or diseases like that, can try and get their lives back. And so this is a third study I wanted to share. It's actually a negative study towards cannabis, but I wanted to pick it apart a bit uh, because I didn't. It's not a very good study, and there's, you can't really take a whole lot away from it. But it was shared by Kevin Sabat, um, a human piece of garbage, uh, one of the neoconservative. Uh, paid political doctors that is very much for opioids and trying to keep cannabis continuously illegal. And so study finds a slight increase in youth asthma rates in states with legal recreational cannabis. Okay, let's dive in and see how accurate this is. And so um, looking at the study, uh, investigators compared asthma rates in states with recreational programs with rates in states where the substance was illegal from 2011 through 2019. And so get this, although the overall incidence of childhood asthma decreased within this time frame, so overall asthma went down, then why are you even writing about this? That, that's the main thing I wanted to point out. So they don't want to highlight necessarily that asthma went down overall. They just want to say that although, you know, it did go down, the prevalence of asthma increased slightly among teens 12 to 17. Okay, well, what, what are 12 to 17 year olds doing that kids that are zero to 11 aren't doing? A lot more. And so no doubt they might be more, you know, at risk of getting asthma than younger kids who aren't exposed to as much. And among children in some minority racial and ethnic groups in states with recreational use laws relative to states where cannabis is fully legal. And I hate this because it just makes me think that they're insinuating that, um, especially because of this sentence, Hispanic youth saw the greatest increase in pediatric asthma rates in states with recreational laws. They're insinuating that parents are smoking within the house and that their kids are being exposed to secondhand smoke. I mean, hey, it's possible. No doubt that that does happen. But to sort of insinuate that from the findings and not, you know, highlight the whole overall fact that asthma has gone down in the broad picture, I just think that's, again, they're trying to target cannabis and make it look bad. And so a few other things I wanted to point out here. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but as they highlight, currently 21 states have legalized for cannabis. And so, what? Wow, that's the danger. We can't allow this to happen. But to carry out the study, researchers assessed data from the National Survey on Children's Health. Data were collected in waves from 2011 to 2012, 2016 to 2017, and 2018 to 2019, and a total of 227,451 children between, again, the ages of 0 to 17 were included. So the fact that they just point out the 12 to 17, obviously 12 to 17 would be more at risk of something because they're living their lives more, they're out and about, and they're just they're shit disturbing, versus kids from 0 to 11. So they don't necessarily include that distinction either. Now, this is all things that I've thought were, were worth pointing out. Let me know in the comments what you think. Uh, also let me know in the comments if you think what I'm pointing out is irrelevant uh, and that this study is, is valid. So I'm just trying to share this, um, but again, it just seems more of like uh, prohibitionists trying to go after weed in any way that they can. They're just getting desperate. Well, then they add a statistically significant decrease in asthma rates was seen from 2011 to 2012 to 2016 to 2017. Many states legalized for adult use during this time. And so you could say, oh, well, when states legalized, we saw, actually saw a decrease in asthma rates, but then it remained stable. It didn't go up. It remained stable where the overall apparently had gone down. And so uh, just another attack from prohibitionists, in my opinion. Now, I could be wrong, though. Let me know in the comments, but moving on because I don't want to take up too much time. So last few stories, MJ Biz Daily shares, as cannabis firms are the main funders of recent legalization efforts, overtaking advocacy groups. And so while this is interesting to point out, it does highlight that there's a lot less money coming in from random people supporting the cause. Uh, and most of it is coming from companies, you know, fighting the fight themselves. And so while that sucks because I wish I had billions that I could help, you know, push into this cause, obviously I'm biased, but I think, you know, it'd be a net positive versus a net negative. Uh, we can see in Arkansas, 99.8% came from, you know, MSOs, 
or single state operators paying uh, in order to get that on the ballot and all that. Maryland, 99.1%. Missouri, 94% came from MSOs. South Dakota, 86.7%. North Dakota, 32.7%. And to think Arkansas, South Dakota, North Dakota, they spent this money and they didn't actually end up getting the you know, the turnout that they wanted to, which sucks. And so not going to go through this whole thing um, because it covers a lot, but just to highlight that it, it's difficult, but it's, it seems to be up to the MSOs that can pay to play uh, to continue to make their way forward, especially in these states that are less competitive. Uh, but so about 13.98 million was spent in Arkansas from MSOs and they did not end up getting the initiative, which is so unfortunate. Uh, Missouri, 4.2, 4.23 million spent. Maryland, 389.4 uh, million spent, or no, 389.4 thousand, North Dakota 595 thousand, South Dakota 629 thousand. So interesting to see how over time less money is coming in from people eager to create positive change. More of it is just coming from the MSOs trying to stay alive. And so with that, uh, we've got another interview from Yahoo Finance. Marijuana legalization is at least three plus years away, Terra Send Executive. So it's an interesting interview. I did read through it. They don't really tell us anything that we don't already know. They're obviously being cautiously optimistic and highlighting that while we knew legalization wasn't anytime soon, they still think we're going to get some incremental uh, reform that might allow, you know, safe banking and some sort of uplifting in the near term. Uh, but not going to go through the whole thing. You can grab the link below as I've covered a lot. Uh, and I think I've talked a little bit too much in the story, but that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. And I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoy this video and you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos, and I will catch you on Wednesday for a midweek update. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care.